So welcome to the Beef Cattle Research Council's webinar on managing pregnant cows for improved cow and calf performance. My name is Stacey Domaluski. I'm the Extension Assistant at the Beef Cattle Research Council, and I'll be your moderator tonight. This session is going to last for approximately one hour, but may go a little later depending on the number of questions you have for us later during the question and answer period. If you're on Twitter, you can tweet along with us using hashtag beefwebinar. And we are recording this session, and I will email out a link to the recording to everyone that is registered within a couple of days. So if you miss hearing anything tonight and want to watch it again later, you can. I would also encourage you to take some notes as well so that you can look them up later and it'll help you to remember a little bit more of what you hear tonight. Of course, on tonight's webinar, you'll be able to hear and see tonight's presenters, but we can't hear or see you. So if you want to communicate with us, please type into the small chat window on the control panel on the side of your screen. If you have questions or comments for either of the presenters, that's the place to do it as well. And also feel free to type your questions in at any time during tonight's webinar and I'll, we'll answer all of them at the end of the hour. If your internet connection is a bit slow, it may help to close the webcam windows. This means you won't be able to see us, but it'll hopefully make the audio come through a bit more clearly and get the slides to load a little faster. All right, so let's get started. So here's what we'll be covering tonight. We'll start with Tracy Herbert. She'll be talking about the value of industry investments in beef research. And then we'll turn it over to Dr. Steve Hendrick to talk about the topic of tonight's webinar. We'll then open it up to questions from you and end with some closing information on where you can find more information on this topic as well as other beef industry publications. So all right, let's get started. So I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker of the night. Tracy Herbert is the Beef Extension Coordinator for the Beef Cattle Research Council, where she coordinates and the development and maintenance of various extension tools for the BCRC, one of which she'll be talking about later today. So Tracy. Thank you, Stacy. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. So I know that for a lot of you tuning in, this is your first BCRC webinar, so welcome. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to um, have you be able to get to know us at the BCRC a little bit better uh, and talk about how and why industry invests in research. So um, the BCRC, we are the national industry-led funding agency for beef, cattle, and forage research. And essentially our job is to identify, fund, and communicate about research priorities that have the greatest potential to advance the competitiveness and sustainability, meaning the economic, uh, social, and environmental sustainability of the Canadian beef industry. So we are funded in large part by producers. So let's just take a minute and talk uh, a little bit about checkoff because every time producers sell an animal, uh, they pay checkoff. Uh, and you're actually paying two separate levies. So there's the provincial checkoff, which in many provinces is $2, in some provinces is 3 uh, And so that is collected by your Provincial Cattlemen's Association and they use that to fund their provincial activities. They also use it to pay their assessment to the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. And so it's through the provincial checkoff that the Canadian Cattlemen's Association is able to do all the work that they do in terms of advocacy, trade, um, policy development, all those types of things. So in addition to paying the provincial checkoff, producers also pay the mandatory $1 national checkoff. And the national checkoff is just used for two things. Uh, part of it goes to Canada Beef, and they use that to market Canadian beef domestically and around the world. And then part of it comes to us at the BCRC to fund research. And so none of the national checkoff is used to fund any type of policy work. It's just for marketing and research. So uh, each province can decide for themselves how they want to split that $1 national checkoff uh, between marketing and research. 
and on average uh, we get about 18% of it. And uh, so for each dollar that we collect from industry through the National Checkoff, we can use that to leverage quite a bit more, particularly from agriculture and agri-food Canada. So government continually tells us, you know, unless industry um, invests in certain things, um, you know, when industry does invest, then they come to the table with dollars as well. And so uh, it's really important to be able to have uh, that industry investment to leverage the government dollars. Because we are funded in large part by producers, we are led by producers. So uh, our council is made entirely of producers from across the country and so you can see that there's representation from BC all the way to Atlantic Canada and there's a great mix uh, on our board of uh, cow-calf, backgrounders, feeders, um, mixed farmers and there's a veterinarian on the board as well. And this is how we have been um, investing in research since 2009, how we've been uh, divvying up the dollars to different research priorities. And so the priorities being animal health and welfare, beef quality, feed grains and feed efficiency, food safety, and then forage and grassland production. So how do we benefit from uh, investing in these different priorities? So one way is through um, establishing and maintaining professional capacity, right? So making sure that the scientists and the equipment and the facilities are in place um, for some of the long-term research, like forage breeding, for example, can take over a decade to develop new varieties. So making sure that those um, facilities uh, and experts are in place to be able to do those types of things as well as for emerging issues. So if there's a new um, animal health issue or food safety issue that the capacity is in place to be able to uh, deal with that. Uh, of course investing in research is obviously very valuable in terms of uh, maintaining or improving production competitiveness. So making sure that producers costs and risks are as low as possible and um, you know uh, as productive and profitable uh, as possible as well and so an easy example would be you know all of the work that has gone into extended grazing um, or improving feed efficiency Research is also needed to be able to support the Canadian beef advantage, which markets Canadian beef as, you know, the best um, beef product around the world. And so investing in research helps us to quantify those claims and make sure that Canadian beef continues to be a very high quality and safe product for people to enjoy. Research is also needed if we're going to have scientifically informed policy, regulation, and trade. So an easy example there would be, you know, any uh, policies or regulation related to the way that we use antimicrobials in the industry, making sure that those um, regulations are based on science, on, um, on evidence, and, you know, knowing what the outcomes would really be um, as regulations come into place. Uh, transportation of live animals would be another good example there. And then public education and advocacy is another one. So being able to um, help the public uh, get a more accurate understanding of what the industry's true environmental footprint is. So in Canada, um, producing a kg of beef now creates 15% less greenhouse gases than it did in 81 because we're continually improving our production practices. It also helps to be able to tell the story in terms of the beneficial uh, contribution that cattle production has. So, you know, being able to sequester carbon or uh, the biodiversity that are on uh, Canadian rangeland. And so you saw there that, you know, in addition to funding various research projects, we're also able to um, invest in technology transfer. So making sure that the results, you know, the knowledge and the technologies and innovations that come out of these research projects that we're funding, 
that we're able to uh, transfer those to industry in meaningful and useful ways. So the vast majority um, of our extension resources can be found on our website, beefresearch.ca. And so when you spend some time on there, you'll see numerous uh, great research overviews, uh, blog posts that offer production tips, um, the latest research, so fact sheets that, that summarize particular research projects. There's some excellent videos there, some decision-making tools, um, and then of course uh, enables us to do webinars like these. So, um, oh, and then another one I wanted to mention was that uh, we also have kind of a um, extension event that we now host at the Canadian Beef Industry Conference called Bove Innovation. So I wanted to just take a minute and um, show you one of the decision-making tools that we've got on our website, which you can find uh, if you go to bodyconditionscoring.ca. So I'm actually just going to close my PowerPoint here and go right to that website. So if you go to it, uh, this is what you'll see. So it's a, it's a great uh, comprehensive resource that um, really drives home the fact that you know, if you put your hands on your animals to get an accurate measure of their fat cover, then of course you can use that information to uh, determine you know, feeding strategies and you know, help make your cow herd really as, um, as productive and uh, profitable as it can be. And so uh, one of the first things it talks about is actually that when we're talking about body condition scoring, we're talking about you know, really putting your hands on the animals because uh, looks can be deceiving. And there was a study done where they had uh, several you know, well-experienced uh, producers do visual assessments of animals and kind of score them visually. Uh, and then they used ultrasound to actually measure the fat. Uh, and their predictions weren't very good. So <laughs> it is certainly worth uh, doing the hands-on version. Uh, there's a great little four-minute video you can take a look at. There's some great fact sheets you can download and print. Uh, and then there's this interactive uh, thing here, which I wanted to show you. And so what this shows you here is the uh, productivity of cows at various uh, body condition scores. So if you move this here, you can see uh, cows in ideal condition. You can drag it over to the left and see them at under conditioned or over to the right as uh, over conditioned. But if we put them in ideal condition here, uh, you can see that their body fat's at about 19%. And pregnancy rates of cows in ideal condition is at 93%. 91% of them will show esterous 30 days after calving. Uh, the quality of their colostrum is excellent. And on average, they're going to wean calves uh, at 515 pounds. So there's this little calculator at the bottom here that's showing you, um, it's estimating the value of your weaned calf crop based on the condition of the cows. So if we assume here that we've got 100 cows, we're going to sell their calves at $1.60 a pound. It's estimating that the calf crop is worth uh, about 74000 But if your cows are a bit on the thin side, so if they're at a score of 2, so we're at 11% uh, body fat here, pregnancy rate drops down to 61%. Uh, Sixty-one percent are going to show estrus thirty days after calving. Colostrum quality is not as good, um, and then your weaning weight drops quite a bit um, because you know if not as many of them are catching in the first cycle, that when you wean, uh, you're going to have fewer calves and you're going to have some younger calves, and so overall they're going to be lighter. So even if you sell those calves uh, at a bit more bump that up to $1.70 a pound, the value of your cash crop, or your calf crop has uh, dropped down to 46000 So if cows come home from pasture a bit on the thin side, um, you'd wonder if you know it would be worth kind of pouring the feed to them to get them up to ideal condition. And so that's what this little calculator here helps you do. So this one is 
pretty simple and of course it, it'd be best to uh, get your feed tested and work with a nutritionist or use some ration balancing software like cow bites but in the meantime you can play with this to get an idea and so we can say here that you know you know I've got silage on hand and some barley and so uh, that I can top it up with and so if you say that your feed barley is worth about five and a half cents a pound uh, your silage is worth about two and a half cents a pound it's assuming about sixty percent moisture uh, and you're gonna uh, feed them for about sixty days to try to bring them up to ideal condition it's gonna cost you an extra about seventeen dollars per cow in addition you know to the feed it would take just to maintain them so an extra 17 bucks per cow for those 60 days but if you compare that to the extra value you're going to gain from your weaned calf crop by having those cows in ideal condition um, you can see that it certainly pays off to do that so this is one of the decision tools that's available on our website, um, which I kind of just wanted to give you a little preview of. Um, and so would encourage you to take some time after the webinar, uh, take a look at this website and, and kind of run your own numbers and see what you find out there. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Stacey. All right. Thanks for that, Tracy. So if you guys have any questions for Tracy, just a reminder that you can type them into your chat window now. We'll answer them at the end of the hour, but um, don't worry about trying to remember them until then. You can just type them in as they come to you. So thank you very much, Tracy. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Steve Hendrick. Steve is a veterinarian at the Coldale Vet Clinic, where he provides veterinary consulting services to both cow-calf producers as well as feedlots. So should be good to go there. Hello everyone. Thank you, Stacy. I'm, I'm not sure if you can hear me there, but um, I want to start, start by saying thanks for giving me the opportunity here to uh, share my uh, slides or my or give this uh, webinar um, so the presentation that I'm giving here uh, is titled managing pregnant cows for improved cow and calf performance and sorry. there we go all right so the outline for my talk is as follows. Um, I guess the theme that I wanted to run with tonight or to discuss with you is, is keeping your cows pregnant um, and how do we manage and do that. Um, so I guess we're going to discuss pregnancy loss and the different types uh, of preg pregnancy loss that occur. Um, and then from that, um, we'll uh, discuss some of the prevention and control strategies that you can utilize on your farm. So um, at any time, I guess if you want to type some questions, uh, feel free to do so. I will uh, try to make sure I answer them as we go. Otherwise, you're welcome to save them to the end and, and we'll address them then. So pregnancy loss, um, it, it occurs throughout gestation or pregnancy. Um, and I, I guess the way I like to think of it, it's sort of a, it sounds bad, a natural selection process. Um, there are a lot of genetic and developmental defects that can occur. And some of those are very lethal. And as a result, uh, some of the pregnancies are lost very early. And so as technology improves, whether we look at using ultrasound or even some of the early conception factors or um, some of those early types of tests, it's allowed us to diagnose pregnancies earlier. And in doing so, we start to realize um, how much more common pregnancy loss maybe really is. Um, the difficulty is, though, it's often difficult to diagnose. 
And that's because the insult often happens well before we, we actually see uh, some of the signs that, that, that show up. And we're, we're going to discuss those here uh, throughout the presentation. So as I said, uh, pregnancy loss occurs at all stages of gestation. And, and like I say, the biggest percentage, and if what I wanted to highlight here was on the graph. Um, and you're going to see that basically on, on the x-axis, I have the week of pregnancy. Um, and on the y-axis is the pregnancy rate. And, and even though it doesn't quite show it on here, it's been estimated that about 9 out of 10 eggs become fertilized by the sperm uh, at a single breeding. And with that, um, uh, as you can see, uh, during the first couple of weeks, whether it's the first two or four weeks, there is quite considerable embryo loss for some of the reasons that we discussed. And so I'll touch on that a little bit later on. But what I want to point out is that you're going to see more gradual loss later on uh, during uh, the final or yeah, the, the last several months of pregnancy. So it's more weighted towards the beginning. So what is normal pregnancy loss? Well, I guess to answer that question, I have to, it sounds kind of scientific, but we say it depends. Um, and I guess were the cows pregnant to begin with? So if you're not preg checking your herd and you don't know whether they were pregnant uh, in the fall, if you're a spring calving herd, uh, then it's really tough to know uh, when it comes to spring if they don't calve whether they were pregnant to begin with. Uh, the other question that I have there is when did you preg check? Um, as I mentioned before, the earlier that we preg check, so if you happen to pull your bulls and 30 days later decide to preg check your herd, um, you may find that you have more pregnancy loss subsequently as compared to if you held off preg checking till maybe a couple of months or a month or, or a couple of months before uh, you actually calve. Um, so, uh, the industry average, um, we typically, the numbers that we throw around or what we consider normal is 2 to 3 percent. So if we look at the Western Canadian Cow-Calf Survey that was completed in 2015, the overall pregnancy rate for the cows was about 93 percent. However, the calving rate was 90 percent. And so you can see the spread in those numbers is 3 percent. Uh, which sort of fits what we consider an industry average or norm. So the first question that I was going to ask Stacy to help me out with here is, um, I want to ask is, of the beef producers out there uh, that are listening to this webinar, um, has your herd experienced a pregnancy loss of greater than 3% per year? Um, so I'm going to, yeah, hopefully we can so the question's up there, so you can vote uh, which one applies to you. Yes, no, not sure, or it's not applicable because you're not a beef producer. And your answers here um, will show at the end a overall graph of what percentage of people are selecting which answer, but your answers are anonymous to the rest of the audience. Thanks, Stacey. We just have a couple more uh, people just trying to click in here really quickly. And I will, still a couple coming in. All right. So results for that, it says about 23% said yes, 43% said no, 11% weren't sure, and 23% were not beef producers. So, I mean, as you can see uh, from, from the survey, I mean, Pregnancy loss has, is experienced by you know, several, quite a few of you, um, certainly not everybody, but uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, yeah, it is a common issue that, that we address in industry. So what I'm hoping to do here as we go forward is assuming that you've, your herd has been experiencing some pregnancy loss, I, I guess I think there's some questions that as a producer you can start asking yourself and, and and try to answer. And so in some ways it's the typical W5, but um, 
Um, so the first question I have listed up there is, well, what is the problem? And we're going to delve into this a little bit more, but is it early embryonic loss? Is it abortion or is it stillbirths? And so those are the three broad categories that uh, I think it's good to try and get a handle on as far as what is the problem that you're dealing with. And so which animals are involved? Well, yeah, you know, we're talking about managing pregnant cows, but, but it could also be your, your heifers that are affected. So you, you want to know what age groups or is it the really old cows? Um, what are they being fed? And we're going to spend some time talking about nutrition and, and some of those nutritional factors that go into this, but, but that's a good question. And is there differences between these groups? What bulls were the cows exposed to? Um, we'll talk about some of the sexually transmitted diseases. Um, uh, do the affected cows have a common sire dam if you thought that there was some genetic component to, uh, uh, to some of the defects that maybe you were seeing in some of these lost fetuses? And finally, when did the problem occur or start? Were the fetuses lost at a certain stage of pregnancy? And over what time period? Um, so typically when I was talking about the industry average, it's sort of that time period from preg checking until calving, but in some instances, uh, like I say, that's going, that time frame is going to vary by, by the herd and how you manage. So. so the common presentations that we see with pregnancy loss, the, the first one is too many cows open at preg check, and hopefully you haven't experience that but you know what we tend to see is cows that are cycling your veterinarian might comment or say especially if they're using ultrasound that there's a you know quite a few cows that are dirty or what have what we call as pyometra which simply means pus in the uterus and so if they've lost their pregnancy early um, what re might remain is, is some of the uh, decaying debris uh, from that, that fetus uh, before it's lost. So in many instances, uh, the fetus is rarely found or seen. And what you have to realize that less than a month of age, there's complete, you know, there's often resorption of that fetus. So you may not see anything externally. Um, and of course, like I was saying, very early on, so uh, within the first two weeks, of, of becoming uh, of yeah, becoming of conceiving um, those pregnancies if they're lost um, that that cow will go on and cycle back um, uh, in, in her next cycle and so I, I guess what we have to realize is that there's probably you know some of these cows that you see re, you know cycle back and you wonder if the bull's working well some of those may actually have just simply been early embryonic loss. Uh, of course, that's good to, to make note and watch that. So as I mentioned on that graph on a couple slides before, uh, the fertilization rate is estimated around 90%. And like I say, the, the most uh, pregnancy loss occurs very early on in that first four weeks. So some of the common causes that we talk about um, would be things like trick or Vibrio or BVD virus. As I mentioned, some of the genetic and developmental defects, especially if they're quite severe, uh, those, those fetuses will be lost at this time. I think if you're in a breeding season where there's a lot of heat, and we call it our heat stress on our animals, um, that they're not you know, getting um, shade or um, being able to get rid of some of that heat, you know, uh, or if there's diseases that cause fever, um, any of that at this time can be very critical and, and affect uh, the fetus as well. And there are also nutrition components as well. So the second common presentation would be finding cows with afterbirth hanging out or you, maybe perhaps you find a lost fetus. And the, I guess the other component to this, occasionally we'll also have cows that surprise us and it becomes late spring and you're antsy to get the cows turned out and you find that there's some cows that still aren't bagging and sure enough they're open and they've, they've lost their, their, their calf. 
uh, through the process. So they've aborted. Um, so I guess if you are lucky enough to uh, find a calf, um, or unlucky enough, I suppose, um, I guess what I've provided here is you know, sort of the, uh, and even if you're preg checking your cows by hand, these are some of the sizes of the calf that, you know, if we're trying to stage a pregnancy, um, that the fetus will be, you know, mouse size at two months or rat size at three and so on and so forth. And the fetus obviously is going to grow and get bigger, uh, eventually start to have hair, and, and we gauge it also by uh, the front incisors or teeth, uh, whether they've totally broke out through the skin or erupted. Okay? So as you're going to see later on, there's many infectious and non-infectious causes of abortion, and we'll, we'll talk about those in more depth as we go here. And the third presentation I want to dis discuss with you this evening is, is occasionally we just see dead calves born at birth. And so this is sort of the last pregnancy loss uh, presentation. Um, so that's your stillborn where the calf is fully developed, its hair, uh, teeth are fully erupted. Uh, we do tend to see this more so in heifers versus cows. Um, and some of that uh, is is due to uh, the proportion of, of the, that calf's weight uh, versus the, the heifers. Um, and he, uh, we also see more stillbirths if, if cows are over-conditioned or severely under-conditioned. Um, in some of my experiences, we've, I've seen more stillbirths if, uh, on cold winters. Uh, I think the intakes of the cows can be greater, and as a result, I think we get more fetal growth, and as a result, just tend to have slightly larger calves that, that can result in, in more difficult calvings. And certainly the malpresentation, so that head back or leg back, can also result in, in dead calves uh, that are otherwise normal. So as we described before, we're defining the problem. So we know now that, uh, you know, based on our three presentations, what type of pregnancy loss we're dealing with. But now we need to dig in as, you know, producers or veterinarians and look at, well, what groups of cattle are most affected? Is it age-related? Is it how we manage them at pasture or my winter feeding? Is there a common water or feed source or a common sire and dam effect there as well? And we do the best as we can to stage what stage of pregnancy we're at, um, because the, all these may give us some clues as to what's happening. So in order to make a diagnosis, um, and if, like I say, if it's you're only losing one calf a year, well, you're probably not going to get too excited. But if you start losing a few more, um, I think it definitely deserves a phone call to your veterinarian to give them a heads up and, and maybe discuss the potential issues that you're seeing. If you've got answers to some of those previous questions, I think that can be uh, useful information to provide. So if you decide to proceed and, and do some diagnostic testing, it's always wise either to have yourself or your vet contact the diagnostic lab and let them know that the samples are going to be coming. Um, that way they can be prepared uh, for some of the testing that you might do. So then you go ahead and collect the samples or if you found a fetus. Um, obviously a fetus, the placenta or cleanings from the cow, unfortunately they don't always clean very well, but, but gathering some of that if you're able is always a benefit. You may also choose um, to collect some blood samples, and we usually, you know, it, it, the closer you can take it to the time of aborting, and then a couple weeks later uh, to allow us to see what changes uh, happen in the titers or the blood levels uh, or the cow's immune response to whatever the agent is if it's an infectious cause. Uh, uh, sometimes we can use that for screening. So the ideal is collecting the fetus and the placenta and the blood samples are a nice add if you're able to do so. So place that dead calf and the placenta and double bag it. It's always a nice thing to do for the lab so it doesn't leak uh, on its way. 
uh, you want to pack it in ice and not freeze it, okay? And that's a common mistake is to freeze. Sometimes you can't help it if they're boarding in the winter time and by the time you may find it. Um, very, you know, it's not uncommon to have a frozen uh, popsicle out there to, to try and uh, send off. But uh, ideally, we, we try to avoid that. And so you can send your blood samples along as well. So we want to get these samples sent to the lab as quickly as, as possible. So, unfortunately though, but be aware if you go looking for, you know, you're using diagnostic testing, typically labs will only find a cause in about one out of three abortion cases. And maybe that doesn't sound good, it's better than not knowing, um, I think. Uh, what I've provided here, and it might be a little fuzzy and I apologize, is the submission or summary of the submissions of abortions, uh, bovine abortions, from 2004 to 2013 from Prairie Diagnostic Services in Saskatoon. What you'll see here of the diagnoses made is about half of them are bacterial, 30% uh, were viral, uh, and the remainder are protozoal, other, and mycotic or fungal infections. And so some of this, I think, relates to the ease of being able to culture or grow some of the bacteria or even the viruses and isolate them. And maybe we have better diagnostic tests for, for some of these diseases as well. And so um, I think that's why the bias and some of it you have to realize that uh, some of the fetuses that get submitted to the lab, it's probably be because they expect it to be one of these types of bugs that we're chasing, okay? So there's a lot of other causes that probably aren't documented here. So as far as infectious causes of abortion, as I mentioned, bacteria cause about, you know, at PDS at least, uh, about half of the documented abortions. Now, there's a wide array of bacteria. Um, what I've included on the list, so I've got Campylobacter or Vibrio and Leptospirosis. You'll notice the asterisk at the end of each of these. What I wanted to indicate here is that both of these we can vaccinate for. Um, there's also Listeriosis, Brucellosis. I won't be discussing much this evening, just given the fact that in, in Canada, um, this has been a, pretty much a control disease and not something we're going to commonly see. I, at the bottom of this list, I've got a few bacteria that, that in all honesty, are probably very rare or, uncom or not as common as some of the other organisms on this slide. Um, the viruses, BVD and IBR, or infectious bovine rhinotracheitis virus, are both relatively, uh, I guess, common. Uh, we'll discuss that a little bit more later on. But And as far as the protozoa, uh, things like trick or neospora and even sarcocystis is, is also another uh, or a few of the other organisms that are infectious in nature. Uh, so they can spread from one animal to the other uh, due to their infections. So to break these down a little bit more and and I think we'll hit on this maybe a little bit later on with control, is I've got some of these organisms and showing when during the pregnancy, whether it's the first, second, or third trimester, that you're likely to see pregnancy loss due to, due to these organisms. And so that's why when you're going through your W5, I mean, uh, and I don't expect you all to be veterinarians, but um, you can make use of this type of information and there's lots uh, as, as Tracy and Stacy mentioned on the web as well that you can access but so things like trick and vibrio uh, we tend to think as more early embryonic death um, as well as BVD whereas IBR and lepto and listeria etc some of these are, are more later in the pregnancy that, that we see the, the abortions. So, as far as non-infectious causes, and that's sort of the two main categories that I put together. Um, so, non-infectious, I'm going to say, typically I'd say relates to nutrition. 
So whether that's moldy feed, so you can actually get fungal infections. Um, Aspergillus is a good example of a mold that can be in your feed. And, uh, but don't forget, even if you've got moldy bedding, um, they can also inhale that, and that too can also spread to the uterus or calf bed and, and cause infection through the blood. Um, mycotoxins, and that's become uh, a bigger issue, I think, uh, or at least we recognize it more. Um, that's maybe more the issue is with ergot and fusarium. Uh, this past number of years, we've recognized that our feeds are probably more contaminated than we realized. And these uh, types of mycotoxins uh, can all cause, uh, cause abortion. If you're in areas where there's ponderosa pines, um, cows that get exposed, particularly as it gets cold, if they're, uh, uh, if they get lost out uh, on the pasture and they get exposed if within a storm, get driven into the trees and start to eat some of these needles, uh, they too could ab abort from that. Now nitrates is the last thing on my list here, and um, there's kind of varied opinions on on how negative nitrates can be. I think it's probably a good idea to do your best to play it safe. So if you're feeding cereals that, that have had frost, um, maybe we're, or it would be worth uh, doing some testing to see what your nitrate levels are if you're going to be using that as winter feed. As far as other causes, and so I'll call this sort of the miscellaneous, uh, once again, I mean, all the way through pregnancy, we can have genetic or even developmental defects that are severe and cause uh, that calf to die. I have listed here rough handling, and I debated on, you know, I, I guess we always struggle. Is that truly a cause? We have to realize that that calf or growing fetus is um, basically kept in a water sack, um, which helps absorb some of the shock. Uh, as you know, if we think of going through a shoot if they're heavily pregnant. Unfortunately, some of our shoots, particularly in the winter, if you're doing scours vaccination, um, they can get quite narrow. We're not able to open them up just due to freezing, etc. And I, I think, yeah, perhaps uh, there, there could be some rough handling. But we also have to realize that we're often stressing these animals at the same time, that we're processing and doing perhaps some other painful procedures to, uh, to these animals uh, that too could, could add. So it's often multifactorial, I guess is what I'm trying to say. In terms of stillbirths or early calvings, uh, just a, you know, twinning, I think, is, is something quite common that we see those show up earlier in, in the calving season. So at this time again I'm going to ask Stacy my question to everyone out there if if you answered yes to having experienced some pregnancy loss um, I guess what I was curious to know was um, was it you know due to an infectious disease or a non-infectious cause like a toxin um, or did you not bother to do diagnostic testing or, or was there no diagnosis that was made? So if you could please, uh, you know, answer that poll, um, I would appreciate that. All right, so the poll's up now. Um, we have a couple more votes coming in. So for those of you who could answer yes to the last question, I'll just give you a couple more seconds here. All right. So it looks like the answers, um, none of them were from infectious disease. About 8% were from non-infectious disease. 19% had no diagnos diagnosis. And 73% had no testing done. Okay. No, that's excellent. So I appreciate um, you answering that poll. I think that's kind of telling, really. Um, and I think by and large, I think that's fairly common, right? If, if we only have a few pregnancies that are lost uh, and maybe, A, you can't find the fetus, um, I think that that's not uncommon. So to have 73% of you 
the answer that no testing was done, I guess, doesn't surprise me. Um, and then it's kind of telling, too, to, to look at our, as far as the answers, as far as no diagnosis uh, to actually having a diagnosis was about one-third. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, for, for those that did get a, a diagnosis, they were non-infectious. So, uh, no, thanks again. That's, that's, uh, appreciate that. So, so the next part of my presentation here, um, I'm going to share a few slides from the Western Canadian Cow-Calf Productivity Study, and I'd like to acknowledge Cheryl Waldner uh, for obviously conducting the study, but also kindly uh, providing a couple of these slides that I'm going to share with you from it. And so the, this is data that was collected on 205 beef herds from across Western Canada during the fall of 2001 and 2. Um, and so what I'm going to share here on this slide is the PM results from the abortions. And I guess a few comments right from the start. Um, what was really neat about this study is that it was a systemic, or systematic, sorry, evaluation of all abortions that occurred in these herds. And so it wasn't just, well, I think I'm going to submit this one, I'm not going to submit this one. I, I think in this case, producers did their best if, if they had an abortion uh, to get them submitted. And so I think some real efforts were made by these producers to do that. So um, what you will see here is about a third of them, there was no diagnos diagnosis made, which is actually quite good. So in about 65% of the cases, a diagnosis was made. Um, what we have to realize is they basically used looking at the tissues and then they had a standardized approach to each dead calf or fetus. Uh, they collected uh, the various tissues and, 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 and evaluated them under the microscope. Uh, and so some of the common lesions that, that were diagnosed in this study were thyroid gland lesions, pneumonia, um, congenital anomalies. So you can see the listing here. The, uh, the two that I've highlighted in red I'm going to come back to. And, and the myocardial necrosis uh, is another one of these. And, and what that means, it's basically the heart muscle uh, looked uh, abnormal or dead or dying. And so there was lesions in, in these muscles. Um, so overall, I guess the, the other point I want to make on this slide is that when we look at things like BVD or IBR, which I admit as practicing vets, we like to think that these are probably a very co are more common causes of abortions than, than, than maybe they truly are. Okay. So uh, this next slide is summarizing what they found on the stillbirths. And I guess not surprising, like we discussed before, or dystocias, and they did, you know, obviously whether they are a malpresentation, et cetera, uh, that wasn't broken out. But, but either way, these were um, difficult calvings, uh, accounted for the biggest percentage. Um, undetermined once again, still about 20%, uh, one in five. But these thyroid gland lesions, um, in this case, the myocardial necrosis was also there, and there was some uh, skeletal muscle myopathies. And what that means is just abnormal muscles or meat. Um, uh, and I'm going to show you some pictures here shortly. So. Um, what we have here at the top is some normal skeletal muscles. So these are your normal beef fibers, right? Uh, nice and straight as compared to this is what um, they were seeing in these calves with the myopathy. Okay, So you can see these muscle fibers look wavy and you know, don't look like uh, these ones up above. Similarly, when they looked at the heart muscle, this is what normal heart muscle would look like under the microscope, whereas this is what, when they have the, the myopathies in the heart muscle, this is what they appeared like in the bottom right. So what was interesting out of this study that I took out of it is that um, 
animal or abortions or stillbirths or herds that had these skeletal myopathies were less likely to consult um, her, or a feed company or nutritionist. Um, so that's kind of interesting. It would suggest that there's probably a nutritional component to these. And it was more likely in herds that did not balance their rations once again. There was no association though, however, with trace mineral use. And that's maybe kind of surprising. Um, but I think I think a lot of herds do use minerals and trace minerals, but we all use them slightly different. And I think that's you know whether it's feeding it for a different period of time or feeding different types of minerals or not, or how we feed it, um, whether it's a block or a lick tub, etc. Um, once again, vitamin E status. Um, so. Skeletal myopathies, um, we often, I guess the most common thing that we think of is white muscle disease, right, in newborn calves, which is associated with selenium and vitamin E. And so I guess we are kind of surprised in some ways that, yes, we have something here that's nutritional, but it's not related to vitamin E status. The other interesting thing was that there was no differences across ecoregions uh, as far as the occurrence of this myopathy. It was least likely in herds where cows had the best selenium status in the fall. And so there again, I think, you know, it is different than white muscle. Um, it's not uh, appearing exactly the same, but this might be uh, almost another presentation or, uh, of this in, in both abortions and, and, uh, and stillborns. So, This leads me into the next part of my presentation, which is, well, how do we prevent and control pregnancy loss? And I guess you could put any disease up here. To me, it's what's the tipping point? Or, so we have all the bugs and different things that can cause abortion on one side, but we've got other management factors, etc., that all play into that as well. And so um, we often have to take a multi-pronged approach to try and address these. So the first thing I wanted to discuss is just nutrition. And I, I apologize, these are pretty generic statements that I'm making, and I, but I still think hopefully there's some value in, in touching on them. So feeding good quality and quantity of feed and water, and I, I want to be specific about that. So that means testing your feed and water. Um, it is surprising, you know, how much variability in our forages occurs year to year and season to season. Um, you know, obviously growing, you know, could be the same stand, but um, there are those yearly differences. So there is value, and part of that is due to when you harvest, etc. Um, even water quality, we have changes that occur over time, sometimes for unknown reasons, but. Um, and it would depend on your water source as well on how dramatically, but periodic testing is probably, is definitely worthwhile. And then of course, then using that information to your advantage and balancing rations accordingly. Um, my next point here is monitoring body condition. And, uh, if, you know, I'm, Tracy did a nice job of presenting uh, what the Beef Cattle Research Council has put together on their website, and I've got the link listed here below because I think that's another valuable tool that you can make use of. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into a great extent on how body condition you know, during pregnancy is going to go on and affect um, uh, future reproductive performance or milking ability and all of that. I, I think. Um, I think that's well known. We know that by the time we hit weaning, right, our energy requirements have dropped. And so that's a good time if we're going to, um, if we're going to try and put weight on some of our thin cows, that we need to do some sorting. And so in a spring calving herd, um, the fall time is often when we're preg checking and weaning. And so we can use those opportunities to sort animals for, for feeding. Um, and I, I think it also avoids feed wastage that we're not getting animals over conditioned, etc. And so um, we can better manage what we're what we're doing. 
So at this point, I guess the third question that I had for you was how do you manage your or group your pregnant cows? I was just curious to, to survey the group. Are they sor sorted by body condition? Are they sorted by age? Um, sorted by age and body condition, or you don't bother to sort your herd. And so uh, do your best to answer that poll. Um, I realize it may be difficult um, that depending on herd size, etc., you may or may not be able to do that or uh, with how your winter feed is, is available to you. Um, but yeah, I'd like to get your responses. All right, so I'll just wait a couple more seconds here. We've got a few more votes coming in. All right, so it looks like about 5% sort by body condition, 32% sort by age, 32% um, sort by age and body condition, and the other 32% sort don't sort at all. So pretty much a three-way tie between the last three there. Yeah, yeah. Well, once again, thanks Thanks for answering that poll. Um, I think that's probably, I guess, where I was expecting it to, to, to fall out. Um, I admit, even as a vet, I've been probably guilty of not pushing or asking or getting producers to use body condition scoring, but I, I do think uh, it is a good tool. Um, and maybe it's not needed on every single cow if they're in obvious, you know, in good condition. But I, I can see where um, sorting by age is also a useful um, tool. And trying to tease them apart too much can also make too many groups to manage as well. So I guess you do what works best uh, for your management system. So a little bit further on nutrition. Um, so if we were trying to avoid mycotoxins um, like ergot or fusarium, I guess I would caution you with grain screenings. Now, in all fairness, though, I do think some of the pelleting mills do a good job of trying to identify loads with, with my, you know, obvious uh, evidence of contamination of these, especially with more awareness happening. Um, but, but it is still something to be aware of. I guess if you get offered a deal on pellets, um, you know, not every time uh, uh, these opportunities are, are worthwhile to, to take advantage of. I guess is all I'm cautioning. If it seems too good to be true, maybe it is, I guess. so. Um, the, the next point that I wanted to ask or, or to bring up is, is mineral feeding. And I guess in some of the research we did at the uh, University of Saskatchewan, we found that, um, especially during the last trimester, um, that growing fetus um, is, you know, we joke about it being a parasite, but it really does. It, 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 it uh, literally sucks the, the minerals uh, from that cow. And so, um, so I think that's an important time to make sure that we're getting mineral. I'd love to see it in front of the cows all year round, but uh, if you have to pick a time, I, I think starting probably two, three months before calving, and then obviously extending um, into uh, uh, as they start calving and lactating, and probably you know definitely out to turn out and beyond if, if possible. So. The question is, I guess, for, for me here, and then I've got another poll here I'd like to quickly find out from you, is, um, is so how do you provide mineral to your cows? Do you provide it in a lick tub? Do you provide it as a mineral block in the feed or other? Or perhaps you don't provide mineral, I guess, is, is the last option here. And we'll just quickly survey the group and, and find out what you do. All right, I'll give you five more seconds here to answer. Okay, so it looks like about 50% are providing mineral in a lick tub, 13% uh, provided in a mineral block, 
15% provided in the feed and 23% um, have another way that they provide it. Excellent. Okay. And I, I, I guess I'm not surprised by that. Um, you know, I guess what we see out uh, working with producers is that lick tubs probably are the more predominant uh, method. I guess the thing we always struggle with is are they getting enough? And so I guess what I want to challenge the group here tonight is given some of the research that came out of Saskatoon with Dr. Waldner's work where you know, we showed some of these myopathies, et cetera, whether it's in the heart or other muscles, um, it really gets us starting to question mineral feeding. And, and I think it's a good conversation to keep having. So um, even in their study, they, there was minerals being used by the majority of producers in that study but yet we still saw some of these issues and we still saw varying statuses. So I guess I think what's, you know, I think we're doing a better job of feed testing and getting energy and protein values, but I'd also encourage uh, to also periodically at least, you know, uh, be doing looking at a mineral panel with it as well in your feeds to get a better gauge of what you've got. And I realize that does add some extra cost, but it, you know, now, having said that, there are resources out there um, looking at some of the forages in the different provinces that, that could give you a gauge of what's there. And, and obviously, if you're working with a nutritionist, they're probably taking that into account as well. Um, and fair enough. Uh, but then it starts the whole discussion about how we do feed it and, and are we, you know, what can we do to improve that. Um, some of the work that I was involved with in the past found that providing the mineral in the feed is probably the best way or approach of getting mineral into the cows. Having said that, I do know intakes on, on lip tubs can be very good as well. So, uh, and perhaps maybe uh, as herd health programs develop in the cow-calf industry, we incorporate in some of that type of screening, whether that means perhaps grabbing some liver samples on, on different animals um, or, or doing some blood testing, which maybe isn't the ideal for every mineral, but uh, at least would give us a gauge on, on, on how we're doing. So um, winter grazing, I think with minerals in particular, you know, can we provide mineral in the feed? You know, every couple of days is another option. I, and that's one place where I've really struggled if you're a, bale grazing or swath grazing, etc. Um, it's one thing if they're in a pen, etc. Um, that might be easier to get minerals into them. And the last point I have on here was just related to exercise and walking to water, etc. Um, I think there is value in that from a stillbirth um, that allows weight control and, and you know, just keeping muscle tone in your cows. So, uh, the next point uh, in terms of prevention and control is, is a vaccination program. And, you know, I guess simply stated, it's your insurance policy from a health standpoint. Now, is it 100%? No, I'm not going to um, try and state that. I think when it comes to vaccinating and controlling pregnancy loss, I, I think you have to give some thought to it, to what types of diseases you might be trying to prevent. And, of course, you'd like to prevent every uh, infectious disease, but uh, give some thought to what your animals might get exposed to. You know, for example, if you are going onto a communal grazing pasture, perhaps some of you know a disease like Vibrio might be more prevalent or not, uh, and might be worth vaccinating for. So. Um, my suggestion here is to work with your veterinarian that knows your herd and knows your area and the risks that are out there and you know, work with them to design a, a proper protocol for your herd. Some thoughts to give is the timing of the vaccination. So it's difficult and if we go back to the slide where I showed all those different infectious diseases or agents and you know what trimester they affected, if you think of something like BVD, where in fact it could probably affect the fetus all the way through, but if you're worried about abortions, that would be early on. So that's why for BVD control, we, we typically like to see 
pre-breeding vaccination. However, if you were worried about IBR, uh, where it's maybe more of a late stage abortion, perhaps boosting at preg check would actually be the opportune time. And so I am not trying to say we should be vaccinating multiple times a year with, you know, and boosting and all that, but that, that's not what I'm trying to say. But just realize, depending on what you think the issues might be, you might tailor your vaccination a little bit different. So just out of curiosity, I think this is maybe the last uh, survey question I have for everybody. And, um, so when do you vaccinate your cow herd for BVD, if you do? Um, so it's either pre-calving, pre-breeding, preg-checking at another time, or you don't vaccinate for BVD. I was just curious to, to get a feeling for, for what people are doing. Right. I'll give you a couple more seconds to get those last answers in. All right. So it looks like about 13% are vaccinating pre-calving, about 50% pre-breeding, 15% pre at preg checking, 5% um, are doing it at another time, and about 18% don't vaccinate for BBB. Well, thanks, Stacy. That's, I mean, uh, I guess it was that kind of falls out where I was kind of expecting. Um, Pre-calving seems like a convenient time to do it. I guess the concern we always have is when you start uh, handling heavily pregnant cows um, and perhaps, you know, causing some abortions or um, uh, as a result of that. So I can understand where people are leery of doing that. The pre-breeding has always been sort of my preference, but like I say, it would depend on some of the issues that maybe you're, you're seeing. So I can understand certainly the convenience of doing it at preg checking. Just be aware that if you're using a modified live vaccine at preg checking, that you want to make sure that those animals have been exposed to it before, or you can you know, certainly cause abortions. And that's what the labels would say on the the vaccines that are available, uh, that uh, are available for use in pregnant cows, if they have such a claim, um, that that's what they would like to see is that uh, that they've seen the vaccine a couple times before. Um, and once again, my preference, my bias would be, you know, using a modified live over a killed vaccine. Um, I just think it does give better protection, but I do recognize and. and and can understand why, uh, you know, it, if, if that's your preference, um, you know, and, or your veterinarian's preference, I certainly respect that. Um, I guess the last point, you know, for, you know, we had almost 20% that don't vaccinate for BVD, and, and uh, you know, I guess some ways, um, you know, I'm not criticizing and saying that's wrong or bad, I guess if, if that's what you've come up with working with your vet, um, I, I suppose uh, that that's definitely reasonable. But uh, in many herds, uh, we don't deal with closed herds, okay? We have to realize that we're you know, often sourcing our genetics, whether that's a bull or even some of our other replacements. And often our herds are often grazed in confinement, um, so away from other herds. So. Um, Anyways, I just caution you and say, you know, if you're, if you're not using a BVD vaccine, um, maybe it's worthwhile considering that, um, like I say, as an insurance policy. All right, so the addition of scours vaccines. Um, if you're going to use scours vaccines, uh, beyond uh, if you decide to combine those with some of the pre-calving, just always be careful doing that. You know, the more shots that we give at a time, A, I think it's more stressful, but we also have talk about um, some of the bacteria that are present in some of the vaccines that we use are gram negatives, and, uh, and so we call it gram negative stacking, and too many of these organisms in these vaccines can basically uh, result in, in the animal aborting in a reaction to that, that uh, 
so that insult. So, so just be aware of that. And like I said, if you have concerns about that, I'm not saying or saying we shouldn't use Scour's vaccine, not at all. Um, they, they can certainly uh, serve us well, but, uh, but just realize that there is some risk in doing so. So for your replacement heifers, I, my, my preference would be to see three doses prior to breeding. And I guess the times that I'm going to throw out here would be at branding or weaning or in pre-breeding. Uh, those, those would be the times to consider it. If you don't use, you know, you vaccinate your calves at a branding, uh, by all means, you could do it at weaning and then booster after that, or ideally even before weaning and weaning again. Uh, just ideally try and get the, those three doses in. And of course, we can use vaccination, particularly IVR in the face of an outbreak if you are dealing with that. So, so that is the one case where we use vaccination almost as a control strategy. All right. And continuing on, um, as we discussed before, I, I think um, in some ways it's you know we often blame the handling of the cattle, but uh, realize that that's probably not the only thing that's happening. What I've thrown a picture up here of is is uh, some of the handling facilities that we see in our feedlots, but also in some of our cow calf operations in southern Alberta. These have been bud boxes with. Uh, uh, some of the twin shoots uh, that will narrow down to a single and they, they work very well and if you've got the right staff you know you can certainly uh, handle cattle very quietly it, it's been amazing to see and so it works very well so I you know not trying to promote uh, one type of system over another but uh, as compared to the old you know, more traditional tubs etc um, I think some of these uh, systems can work very well. Um, so in terms of efficacy of vaccination and preventing uh, abortions, I just wanted to throw up uh, or make reference to this study that came out in 2015. And basically, it's a meta-analysis. So it means they summarized a number of trials. And what they found for BVD vaccination is that if you do vaccinate for BVD, You'll decrease your abortions by about 45%. You'll reduce the number of fetal infections. So that means uh, basically fetuses or unborn calves that get infected um, but don't die uh, or get aborted. They get born alive but they're infected. And so we can significantly reduce that. Um, and it can improve your pregnancy rate uh, by 5% is what they document. So uh, I think, you know, I didn't put economics to it for the talk tonight because I think you can do that on your own. But um, the reality is that using these vaccines, I, I think there is some value and we don't know always when we're going to get exposed. It's just like we don't know if, our, if and when our house is ever going to burn down, right? So the last prevention and control is just going back to good old biosecurity and it's kind of a you know, it seems kind of like a boring topic, but but realize that uh, you know if you're using communal grazing pastures, that you know we need to be doing screening of our bulls for trick and vibrio, and obviously not allowing you know if there's animals that have aborted, um, you know not sending these dry cows to pasture, etc. Um, you know we talk about purchasing virgin bulls and heifers, and I always have to kind of chuckle at that. Um, because do we, you know, as, as I was once told that virginity is just a state of mind and, and I guess for these animals too, uh, do we truly know that they, they haven't done any breeding and so, you know, you always want to be cautious with that. Certainly culling can be, is something you may consider for some of these animals that abort um, just due to, the, if you're not sure what's going on, uh, you may choose not to give them another chance, which uh, and certainly isolation, right? There are some of these that are infectious processes and if we can get them separated off, uh, it becomes less of an issue uh, for the entire herd. The last point that I've made here is more in reference to Neospora infections. Now these are protozoa that are passed in dog uh, manure or feces 
and uh, as well as coyotes or other canids. And so I guess what I always struggle with, I mean, we can do testing at least of your farm dogs to see whether or not they're infected. And I guess, you know, if they are, you can manage that appropriately. Um, but, um, you know, to me, it's probably if you've got dogs around, typically you see less coyotes. And so I think that's a good thing. So I guess what I'm saying is don't go out and shoot your dogs uh, just because you're worried about you know, spore. I think it's, it's important to, uh, you know, that we do our best to try and manage. So with that, um, I'd like to summarize what, what I've presented to you here this evening. And so to me, pregnancy loss is a natural process. And of course, in moderation, we, we don't want to see excessive pregnancy loss. And obviously, the less, the better. Uh, but And it can happen at any stage. And realizing that it's more heavily weighted to the beginning, right? And there are many, many causes of pregnancy loss. And my, my goal here tonight was not to you know spend time going through each and every single one of them in gory depth. Uh, because I think there's people out there that you can consult and work with, but just simply recognize when you are having a problem and that you need some help in dealing with it. So I guess what I'm hoping is that, you know, we just go back to the basics, apply good herd health and nutritional management. And, you know, it sounds so simple to do, and in some ways it is, and in other ways it's not. So. But, but, you know, like I say, there's good people that you can work with to get that done. And I think, yeah, I think it pays off to do that. Um, having said all that, you know, I recognize that wrecks are still going to happen. You know, you, you know the best that we can do, even in best well-managed herds, uh, occasionally we still have some issues that pop up, whether it's pregnancy loss or other issues. And so I guess... What I'm trying to say is, yeah, we're all still human and, you know, not everything's going to always be perfect, but, um, yeah, just trying to make you aware of what we can do to hopefully have, you know, a good calving season next spring and lots of calves. So with that, I, once again, yeah, I'd like to uh, thank Stacy and Tracy for the opportunity to talk to you this evening. Now, if you've got any questions, I, you know, I'd be more than happy to to do my best to answer them. Great. Thank you very much for that. There was lots of great information there. So just a reminder, um, we'll open it up to questions now. And on the side of your, in your control panel, you should see a question box where you can write in any questions you have for either of the producers. Some of you have already found this and have been sending questions in. If you're missing your control panel, if you don't see it on your screen anymore, you should see a little orange arrow. Just by clicking that arrow, you'll be able to expand your control panel again. All right, so the first question here is for you, Steve. So um, this person's writing in and they're asking about a product, an injectable supplement, so a product such as Multimin 90 that they use pre-breeding in their cows and heifers. Um, is there a benefit to administering these type of products pre-calving as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess what we've found with injectable minerals um, is um, it's all in the timing, right? So if, if you're looking to reduce retain placentas or, you know, improve how the cows clean up after calving, um, certainly uh, the duration of effect is on, you know is only so long and so the closer you can do that so um, right at calving if that's what your ultimate goal is you'd probably want to get it in a week or two ahead of calving right and so um, perhaps if you're going to do it um, you know depending on what you're using if you're using scours vaccination and you could give it just prior you know it might improve that and improve some of the viability and uh, of some of these calves as well with that um, so yes, no, I think it is another tool in the toolbox if that's a, you know, it is one way, I guess, if, as long as you're careful giving your injections, you'll know that they've at least gotten, you know, uh, some of that mineral, uh, as compared to just hoping that they're, they're consuming the right amount, so. 
All right, thank you. Um, so just a reminder, you can type your questions into the question box on your control panel. You should be able to find it there. And if your screen's cold, um, if your screen's not there, there's a little orange arrow that you'll be able to find that will expand the control panel. So the next question here is, does line breeding have an effect on pregnancy loss? Ah, uh, that's a great question. So, you know, I, I think if we start looking at line breeding, um, I think it would depend on what, you know, what extent of inbreeding and, you, you know, if you are a purebred breeder, you can get into what some of these inbreeding coefficients are. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know off the top of my head what percent uh, inbreeding, at what point you will start seeing more issues with, uh, with line breeding. But yes, it, you certainly will bring out, uh, you know, interestingly enough, it's the way that some of our breeds were made pure, but, but um, you know, it, it only goes to a certain extent, and then you start seeing some of the more recessive effects of it. So, um, certainly there can be value in it to a point, but, but we do need to be careful with that. And I think, you know, if you yeah, it looked in the literature, and I could try to do that after here, I'm pretty sure there are some inbreeding coefficients that would be out there and you could, uh, or would be recommended to look at. So. All right. Uh, my next question here is for Tracy. So, Tracy, would you be able to explain how the dollar amount of the two different wean calf crops are being calculated in your presentation when you talked about that part? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm just going to bring it up on my end just to remind me what those numbers were. Okay, so in the first example that I gave, um, so we had assumed that there was 100 cows in ideal condition. And so with a pregnancy rate of 93, you're, you're going to assume that you have 93 calves. Um, we assumed a 3% calf loss. So uh, we're weaning, in that first scenario, we're weaning 90 calves that are an average of 515 pounds. So selling those at $1.60 a pound uh, is where we got the $74,000. In the second scenario, with the cows that were under-conditioned, um, the pregnancy rate is 61%. So um, if you assume a 3% death loss, again, you're going to assume that you're going to only wean 59 calves. Um, on average, they are going to weigh about 460 pounds. So selling them at $1.70 a pound, um, is where we got that second number of uh, 46,000. So that's how those calculations are done. All right, thanks. Um, my next question is for Steve again. How common are abortions from hay with some kind of mold? And is there anything that can be done to silage, um, or to salvage this hay, sorry, so grinding, rolling, um, something like that? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think if you looked at PDS's data, right, the mycotic counted for somewhere between 5 to 8 percent, I believe. And so, um, you know, but of course, like I was trying to show in the grand scheme of things, perhaps there's more or less, right? And if I could pull up Dr. Waldner's work here, it was probably a little bit below that for sure, uh, that are, my, you know, due to mycotic infections. Um, now, having said that, what can you do about it? Um, of course, yeah, you do your best to try and prevent it, whether that means tarping or stacking your bales appropriately to shed water and try and avoid, you know, molding in the first place. Um, but if you've got moldy feed to deal with, I, I do think um, grinding or busting them um, certainly might help knock some of the spores out. But at the same time, if you're, you know, uh, using a bale buster, you know, around the cattle, of course, you know, they're going to inhale some of those spores as well, which may not be ideal as well. But, um, like I say, it, it is difficult. You kind of have to work within the system you've got, but just be aware of that there is some risk. Now, I mean, I think for the vast majority of herds, um, they all get exposed to some degree of, uh, of molds. Um, I think it's pretty rare not to. So in the grand scheme of things, I, I think we need to just be aware that there is some risk there. 
Um, and there are some telltale signs of looking at the aborted fetus if you do start to see some of these as well, but that, that might give you an indication. But anyhow, uh, yeah, that, I guess I, I still think grinding would, would be a reasonable approach. Now, I kind of forget the second part uh, to that question that was regarding silage, I believe, as well, right? No, sorry, that was just me misreading it. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the second part was about what she could do or what they could do to salvage the... Okay. Um, so I have one more question here, unless somebody has one that they'll quickly type in. So what would you suggest in terms of blending off mycotoxin-affected feed um, for pregnant cows? So just not at all, or...? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and, and it's, you know, the... It's always interesting. The more we learn, the more a we realize what we don't know. But it just always seems to raise more questions, right? Um, we used to think that just counting, for example, ergot bodies in a sample of grain was good enough. But I think some of the research that's coming out is saying no, really, until you measure what the alkaloid levels really are, that all ergot kernels aren't the same or get bodies right and and so um, and so I guess that's why I'm really struggling to say you know that you know, I think that's a logical approach to take some dilution effect um, I think you'd probably want to take a pretty safe effect right and and so we can still use some of the recommendations that are out there but I think you probably want to split them in half at least right if, you, if you're dealing with pregnant cows because to me, there's nothing worse than, you know, why would you want to take that risk in these cows? I mean, there might be other groups or other animals where that could be fed. So, um, like I say, I think it's just something to be really cautious with. So, All right, so I did have one more question come in here, and then we'll call it quits for the night. But does grinding bales with ergot help compared to just rolling the bales out, or will grinding and breaking up the ergot... ergot be beneficial? I guess in theory by grinding you may dis see the worst part is you may disperse it more broadly right but also I guess if there's fines perhaps some of those are going to get lost um, so I can understand that I, I, um, I, I think if you had yeah, cereal crops that you were going to feed um, with ergot it'd still be worth I think probably shredding it from that standpoint as well. Uh, once again, I have to be careful. I don't have a whole lot of science there to state that. That's just sort of an opinion. Um, but, but that's what you're getting, I guess. So, uh, so I, that, that would be my bias, um, is how I would you know, try to manage that. All right. Um, so with that, I think we're going to um, end there for the night. So. I just have a couple more things before I let you go. So the last thing is where to get more information and science-based production advice through the BCRC. You can go to our website, beefresearch.ca, and click the subscribe button to sign up for our free email list. If you have Twitter, Facebook, or a YouTube account, you can connect with us there as well. And I would also encourage you to sign up and visit the Canadian Cattlemen's Association website where you can, um, cattle.ca, where you can sign up for their free newsletter called Action News. Um, I'd also like to remind you of our next upcoming webinar, which is what is the environmental footprint of beef production? Now, this date may change slightly. I just, um, I'm just sorting it out right now, but when I send you up a follow-up email, I will have the correct date in it. So with that, uh, very shortly, as soon as the webinar ends, you'll be asked to complete a short survey that asks about tonight's session and what you are most interested in for future webinar topics. We do need your feedback to do the best job we can to deliver information that's both useful and meaningful to you and helps you make informed decisions on your operation. So we're always looking for new topics and new ideas. So please complete that survey and don't hesitate to contact me with questions, comments, or suggestions at any time. As I've mentioned, you'll receive an email from me in a couple of days with a link to watch the recording, as well as links to some additional information on um, managing pregnant cows. So that's it. I want to thank everyone at home for joining us tonight. And on behalf of everyone, thank you to Tracy and Steve for volunteering your time and expertise tonight. So good night.
Thanks.